As I said in a previous video, Pluto is perhaps the most mysterious object in the solar system. A planet, and yes, I still call it a planet, that defies all other types of objects that are in any way the same size or the same configuration. It's just radically different. And now, recent theories seem to indicate that it has a subsurface ocean of considerable size and perhaps life. Mountain ranges of water ice, the height of the Rockies, and a vast plain comprised of slushy nitrogen. And on top of that, organic molecules, and as I mentioned before, an ancient subsurface ocean the size of Texas. So old, in fact, that the amount of time necessary to develop complex life, not intelligent, but complex, could very well have existed on Pluto and could be waiting for us to discover it. And that's not all. There's also the planet of Neptune. We've only seen this planet up close once in human history when the Voyager 2 passed it by. And it's such a pity because it is such a unique place. It's not a gas giant in the same way the Jupiter and Saturn is, but rather an ice giant with very different types of composition of its clouds and impossibly high wind speeds as high as 2100 kilometers per hour. But these planets are impossibly far away, at least when we're talking about a manned expedition. I mean, billions upon billions of kilometers. No matter how interesting the planets and their moons like Charon and also Triton, both of which probably have subsurface oceans of their own and the possibility of life, and yet they are so far removed that they seem beyond our reach. And yet, is that actually the case? Are these planets of the outer solar system really beyond our reach? And more importantly than that, can we go further? As far away as the outer solar system might seem, interstellar distances are far greater, where we measure distances not in billions of kilometers, but in light years and parsecs. How can we possibly reach destinations like this? Well, believe it or not, there's a NASA-funded study called Project Valkyrie that could not only take us to the outer solar system in the space of a few months, but also possibly bring us up to 92% of the speed of light and give us the stars, using something that we always thought was just science fiction, and that's antimatter. Welcome to yet another episode of The Angry Astronaut. So, as you may have been able to tell from the intro, this episode is going to be talking about antimatter. This is a subject that I have avoided for a very, very long time, simply because I didn't think that it was a practical form of propulsion or a practical kind of fuel that we could use any time in the foreseeable future, simply because of the immense difficulty of producing it. However, some studies were brought to my attention that were carried out by the NASA Institute of Advanced Concepts. And by the way, these were funded and peer-reviewed studies. We aren't talking about some guy with a dubious degree with a funny looking beard um, uh, uh, anyway, claiming that he found antimatter or knows how aliens are making use of antimatter on their flying saucers. This is a study that 
not necessarily proves, but strongly indicates that antimatter exists in our own solar system and in varying quantities, depending on where you go to look for it. And it doesn't, it not only does it exist, but also it could be mined or harvested is the exact term that's been used. And once this antimatter is harvested, it could be used for propulsion on magnitudes beyond anything I've ever talked about on this channel. We're talking about relativistic speeds here being provided not by nanograms or micrograms of antimatter, but by kilograms worth of antimatter. Does this sound impossible? I have to tell you, a few weeks ago, this would have sounded impossible to me. But after reviewing these studies, I think this deserves a second look. So we're going to take that second look right now. Now, just about any proposal for an antimatter spacecraft is immediately shot down by the notion that we can't make antimatter. But you know what? Nature can. Gamma ray bursts from thunderstorms actually produce antimatter. And we've known this for a while. We've detected it with our Fermi satellite designed to study gamma ray emissions. Since its deployment way back in 2008, the Fermi telescope has picked up no less than four incidents of antimatter actually striking the telescope. And on the first occasion, it was hovering over the Middle East when a thunderstorm over the horizon produced a gamma ray burst that actually produced antimatter. Let me explain how this happened. Powerful thunderstorms produce bursts of electrons that are traveling at speeds close to that of light. And when these electrons collide with another atom, they produce a gamma ray burst, a very small scale one, of course, that when it strikes another atom, on occasion produces two particles, one of which is an electron and the other is a positron, which is antimatter. Now, the reason these positrons aren't instantly annihilated because matter and antimatter tend to cancel each other out is because they follow the magnetic field lines of Earth's magnetic field until they come into contact with something, namely, in this case, the Fermi satellite. So when the antimatter struck the satellite, it created its own gamma ray burst and set off the satellite's own instruments. Quite amazing. And then when the antimatter came back along the field lines later on, it again set off the instruments. And as I say, this has happened on four different occasions. So this indicates that we don't have to spend trillions of dollars to make antimatter. It already exists in our own magnetic field. But is there a way to do this? Well, according to James Bickford at Draper Laboratories, and his study is linked in the description, it is possible. Although the magnetic field of Earth may not be the best target, a very small amount of antimatter seems to be stored and protected by the magnetic field lines of our own planet. Now, the best target may surprise you, and that's the magnetic field generated by the rings of Saturn. According to the study, they generate about half a milligram worth of positrons or antimatter per year, or the equivalent of a Hiroshima bomb every year when it comes to the amount of energy that can be utilized. To put it in another way, two years worth of production from Saturn produces enough antimatter to produce the same amount of energy, actually a little bit more, 9 times 10 to the 13th power joules, than a nuclear reactor with 1 kilogram of U-235 fuel. So essentially antimatter is 1,000 times as powerful and as efficient as nuclear power. However, you wouldn't have to look at Saturn alone. There are other sources, such as the tales of comets, according to the report. These also could be good sources of antiparticles of various kinds being subjected to cosmic rays and the antimatter that goes with it. 
And speaking of cosmic rays, it has been postulated in the report that cosmic rays hitting the magnetic fields of large planets such as Jupiter produces tremendous amounts of antiprotons. We're talking 9.1 kilograms on an annual basis for Jupiter, 1.3 kilograms for Saturn, and about a third of a kilogram each for Uranus and Neptune. Pretty damn insane. So essentially what this means is instead of spending trillions upon trillions of dollars to artificially produce antimatter every time the subject is brought up, you instead mine the magnetic fields of some of the larger planets in the solar system where antimatter occurs naturally. And this makes sense because antimatter should exist in the universe and in larger quantities than we've detected it. Now all of this is well and good, but how the hell do you harvest antimatter, especially such small quantities? I mean, even if it's kilograms, it's still not a lot if we're talking about the mass of some of these planets without having the antimatter come into contact with matter in the process and destroying your energy supply. Well, there's a pretty inventive solution for that as well. The solution is to build something similar to a bussard ramjet that's depicted here, although a lot smaller. This is used to produce a ship that would travel close to the speed of light. But in order to just collect antimatter, all you would need is an electromagnetic coil, or rather two pairs of them, with a radius of 100 meters and a weight of some 7,000 kilograms. You'd need 200 kilowatts to operate operate the system, which would not be all that difficult with nuclear or, or solar power. The scoop would enter an orbit around whatever planet that it was collecting the antimatter from, corresponding to the field lines of that planet's magnetic field. It then would capture the antiprotons. So this solution essentially creates an artificial magnetic field which concentrates and drags in the antiprotons and also serves as a magnetic field to isolate them from any matter which might come into contact with the antimatter, thus keeping it safe. Quite a unique and elegant solution. But once you have the antimatter, what do you do with it? Well. This is where Project Valkyrie finally comes into play. Project Valkyrie is the brainchild of one Dr. Charles Pellegrino, who was a scientific advisor on the movie Avatar. And essentially what this is, just so you don't strain your eyes, is a ship on a string, consisting of a magnetic coil at the front, which generates a magnetic field against which particles from the matter-antimatter reaction zone are bounced. And then the coil is pulled forward, and therefore the entire ship is is pulled forward. The engine starts out by producing a controlled fusion reaction. If you'll recall from my episode on fusion ships, you need a large amount of heat in order to make hydrogen fuse into helium, and the antimatter reaction would create that, and the byproducts of this reaction would be electromagnetically driven out at speeds between 12 to 20 percent that of light. These incredibly fast-moving particles then simply bounce off of a second magnetic field, as you can see from the diagram there's two of them, giving away their energy as thrust. And so your ship starts slowly accelerating, hopefully at about at a rate of 1g constant, until you get up to a speed between 12 to 20 percent that of light. Already your ship is moving at an insane speed. Once your ship gets up to that speed, then you're transitioning over to a pure matter-antimatter reaction, using the byproducts, which are particles called mesons and muons, to provide your thrust. And these particles travel at about 99% of the speed of light. And slowly you climb your way up to 92% or so of the speed of light. 
So where's the crew compartment? Well, as far away from the antimatter reaction as you can get it, about 10 kilometers, and so the tether you would have to build would be probably of some sort of high-tech carbon, although some sort of uh, Kevlar might be able to do the trick, depending on the level of acceleration we're talking about. Because of the large amount of gamma rays that result from this reaction, Dr. Pellegrino describes riding an antimatter rocket like riding a giant death ray bomb. So on top of the distance, in addition to that, you put a shield, a block of tungsten to the tether, about 100 meters behind the matter-antimatter engine. So what do you do about tiny particles heading at your ship at 92% of the speed of light? Well, the good doctor recommends to throw or dump intercepted engine heat into a fluid, which would be organic material and such, and throw streams of hot droplets out ahead of the ship. And then the droplets radiate their heat and load into space before the ship accelerates and recaptures them for reuse in the future. The droplets then ionize most of the atoms that they run into by stripping off their electrons, and then the electromagnetic rocket moves the resulting shower of particles made up of protons and electrons off to either side of its magnetic field in the same manner as a boat's prow pushes aside water. And by the way, most of these are direct quotes from Dr. Pellegrino. I certainly couldn't come up with anything like this. And another advantage is that the droplet shield is constantly renewing itself. If you get a big dent in it because of some sort of large particle or piece of matter that the ship encounters at high speed, then the outrushing spray refills it in very short order. It's really, again, a pretty simple and elegant solution to close to light relativistic travel. And what about deceleration? Well, back to the diagram we go. This is why the vessel has two engines. When you reach the midpoint, you start applying thrust with the second engine against your velocity until eventually you reach a reasonable speed when you arrive at your destination. And by the way, the crew cabin would need to be moved all the way down the tether as well, so it could be 10 kilometers away from the antimatter reaction. And here's a perfect solution for that crew cabin, and we've seen this before. The Bigelow inflatable habitats, a number of different configurations would work, and the ship is designed to haul a payload of 100 tons, which is roughly the size of one of these inflatable units units. Now one of these crew modules would be more than sufficient for a small expeditionary crew to another star system, say six people or so, and if you're worried about the lack of gravity during this travel, keep in mind that for two years of the journey, one year accelerating and one year decelerating, you would have to be at 1G in both cases simulating Earth gravity, and during the rest of the journey, at 92% of the speed of light, each year for you would be three years on the outside because of time dilation. As a matter of fact, if you could maintain 1G acceleration until you hit 99.9% .9 of the speed of light, you could travel from one side of the universe to the other in a human lifetime as far as the human inside the ship was concerned. To paraphrase Carl Sagan, Funny things happen when you travel close to the speed of light. But one year for every three? That's pretty good as far as I'm concerned. And so there you have it. With our current understanding of physics and engineering and just about everything else, we can theoretically build something that could take us to a place like this within our lifetimes. Kinda hard to believe. 
But even if it turns out that we can't, if it turns out that antimatter is more difficult to harvest than these studies indicate, or that Dr. Pellegrino is off his rocker or something along those lines, antimatter gives us the potential to travel even at its minimum speed of velocities approaching a thousand kilometers per second at the very least, which puts destinations like this within our reach within the space of a few months. And that is something that seemed completely impossible not too long ago as well. Wouldn't that make researching this topic worth it a lot more aggressively than we're already doing it? Well, I'm pretty biased, but I certainly think so. What about you? So there you have it. A method by which antimatter can be harvested and put to use. Maybe not in my lifetime, but certainly within the next century, to give humanity the capability of traveling to the outer solar system, the Oort cloud, something along those lines in a very short amount of time, and perhaps even give us the capacity of reaching the stars. And do you know what pisses me off? Every time you look up just about any article or any source about antimatter propulsion, they always bring up the fact that producing antimatter is virtually impossible, that it would cost more than the combined output of the entire planet many, many times over, and that it isn't going to be practical for centuries, if not millennia, assuming that it's ever going to be practical. And you know what? That may not be the case. Not at all. And we've hardly even looked into this. We've hardly investigated it. And if we were to discover that antimatter is available in our solar system in the quantities that we've talked about in this episode, it would change everything for the human race, not just in terms of propulsion, but also in terms of power for our entire civilization. Things would change so radically. They would also change, unfortunately, in terms of the types of weapons that we might be able to create. And that, I must say, is pretty damn terrifying. But all of that having been said, I'm glad that I took the time to look into this, and I hope that you guys enjoyed this particular episode because it is a little out on the fringes compared to a lot of the stuff that I tend to do. But that is what this channel is all about. And if you want to continue seeing content like this, content that sometimes pushes the boundaries well, it's all in the description. You can support me on Patreon. You can support my sponsors, folks who make models like this, Spaceship Mania, get your own starship. There are many ways to support me through my merch. I don't have to talk too much about it. You know how to do it. And I've got a number of names once again being listed here of people who have decided to support me. And now we have additional benefits, including exclusive videos. I just released my first one um, very recently, just a little while ago to my supporters. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to being a supporter of this channel as I continue to grow. And don't forget... This coffee cup, this hated Starliner coffee cup, 40,000 subscribers, and it is going to meet the Boeing gods if those indeed exist. So keep all of that in mind. And until we actually have the courage to invest the effort, the money, and the scientific know-how that's necessary for us to exploit such an immense power source, such a power source that we thought was just science fiction for so long, until we're ready to make that step. I urge all of you to stay angry about space. <laughs>